Our presenter tonight is Lauren Paws. Lauren moved to Prescott Valley after retiring in 2014. She became a master gardener in 2019 and has served as the Speakers Bureau Chair over the past few years. She is an avid backyard gardener applying information gained to all aspects of caring for her yard and that of her community. I am really excited to hear this presentation, Lauren, so take it away. Well, thank you, Tricia. I am so excited about this presentation um, on poinsettias because I actually um, had the Eckies as part of my board of directors and I consider them friends we keep in touch. And so um, they have actually, I wanna share the, given me um, access to their photos and proprietary information, which is now archived at the Cal State University San Marcos. And both the Cal State and the Ecke family has been very gracious and helpful in, um, in helping me put this presentation together. I've also used other uh, references, which will be at the end. And any photos that are not from the Ecke archives are, um, are acknowledged as I use that particular photo. So tonight is about poinsettias. Um, this is actually a presidential bouquet, and I'll talk about that in a little bit later of how that was developed. But all of Eki's plants are gorgeous, um, massive at times, and are long lived if you do proper care and feeding of them. So the origin of the poinsettia, and by the way, it can be pronounced poinsettia or poinsettia, either one is correct. It is a plant species of blue cherima in the Euphorbiaceae family, and I pardon me if I have these mispronounced. They're indigenous um, to New Mexico, um, up to Southern Guatemala, and they actually do extend somewhat into per Peru and Chile. They are tropical, they're growing at mid elevation, and when they grow, they're, they're facing on the slopes, facing the Pacific Ocean. They're known as the Mexican flame flower or painted leaf flower. And their genetic analysis shows that wild populations in Uero and Oaxaca are the ancestors to the cultivated poinsettias that we know today. So the poinsettia is actually a shrub or a tree. It can grow between two to 13 feet. And the original had red and green foliage. We of course have seen many other poinsettias with different colors and those are hybrid and been grafted to get different colors and different types of leaves. The color leaf parts of the plant are called bracts and often they're mistaken for flower petals but they are, they are neither a leaf nor um, the flower. The, they are located below the flower which is the tiny little yellow um, small grouping of saita in the center of the plant. The brack color is created through a process called photoperiodism, and that requires approximately 12 to 14 hours of total darkness at a time for six to eight weeks in a row to change color. And that means total darkness, not even a, floor, a light in the room, like a small a light could change that process. They also require abundant light at the other part of the time during the day for the bracts to receive the brightest color. And again, as I mentioned, the small yellow flowers are actually the flower in the center of the plant. The poinsettias are short day plants and they do actually do not produce flowers year round. It's only once a year. And it is the exposure to darkness that is critical to the formation of both the colorful bracts and the flower buds. So, this is, I think, extremely interesting. Um, I think we all grew up learning that poinsettias are poisonous. This is absolutely not true. The leaves contain cucurl um, acetate, which are a component of latex, and that's the white milky substance that we find in the plant if we break off a leaf. The pear pen is also found in the leaves, and that is actually being investigated as the foundation to treat Alzheimer's disease. So how did it become known as toxic? Well, in 1913, the Honolulu Star Bulletin wrongly alleged the plant was deadly. And this legend has stuck with the plant to this time 
in, in, in our current day. And to make matters worse, in 1970, the US Food and <clears throat> Drug Administration erroneously released a bulletin stating that one leaf can kill a child. I know even in my uh, household of my kids, they won't have a poinsettia because they're afraid their dog or cat will eat the leaf and die. So a study by the American Association of Poison Control showed no fatalities between 1985 and 92 related to poinsettia exposure. Every call that came in was investigated and no one died from having digested, <clears throat> ingested the poinsettia leaf. What is interesting though, is it can induce asthmatic and allergic rhinitis in certain groups of people who may be allergic to latex. So as we know, when we go to the hospital, they say, do you have an allergy to latex? Because that could put you into a seizure. And that I think is how the poinsettias were, have become to be known poisonous. So little is known about the pollination in wild poinsettias. They do note that wasps are the one things that were that like to visit the Saitha. Now, one of the problems with the way you can see these, the little yellow flowers, they are not conducive for bees or other pollinators to actively pollinate. In this picture, which I got from Bixbay.com, you can see but some butterflies on it, but even that is not a true pollination source. The flowers are small in size and they reduce even more when they first bloom because they're crowded together and it makes it difficult for bees and other true pollinators to, to access the flower. And the flowers are unisexual, they're either male or female, um, which means they could self-pollinate. However, most of the growth of, of our poinsettias that we know are from grafting. So for our cultural history, um, the Aztecs called the plant the flower that grows in the soil. It was cultivated by the Aztecs originally for use in, in their traditional medicine to reduce fever and then for the red dye that it would create. It's known in Mexico and Guatemala as Flor de Noche Buena, which means Christmas Eve flower. Um, and of course, that is the origin of how we have gotten to know the poinsettia. In Chile and Peru, it is known as the crown of the Andes because there too it grows. In the 16th century, there is a Mexican le legend that introduced the plant as the Christmas flower representing the star of Bethlehem and the red color representing Christ's crucifixion. And it revolved a little about a little girl named Pepita and sometimes they call her Maria in the story. And the family was very poor and so for the Christmas celebration, she went and collected many poinsettias from the field and brought them and laid them at the altar of the church. And that's how the legend began as the Christmas flower. And since the 17th century, Franciscan friars in Mexico included poinsettias in all their Christmas celebrations. And this tradition has gone around worldwide as, at this point. So let's go from the, cult, the history and the culture to our current history. It, um, it, the poinsettia was, name is derived from the, the person Joel Robert Poinsett, who was a botanist and was the first United States uh, minister to Mexico in 1833, 1836, I'm sorry. And he introduced the plant to the US in the 1820s when he sent plants to his greenhouses in South Carolina. In 1834, uh, German scientists Johann Klauch and Carl Wildenau um, saw the plant and identified its species as Plucherma and was and has not that's how it is now defined in our botany digest. It has become a commercially important crop in the early 1920s when the Ecke family and Ents moved to Exenitas and started massive production of the uh, roots. So the Ecke family I think it pay it does a lot to pay them homage and talk about how they developed this, this remarkable Christmas flower in the United States, States and worldwide. So Albert, Albert Ecke emigrated from the, um, Germany to Los Angeles in 1906, where he owned a dairy, an apple orchard, and some flower fields. 
He was so intrigued by the poinsettias that grew in the uh, Mexican neighborhood that near where their, their orchards were, that it became finally the a focus of the family business. In 1923, his son, Paul Ecke Sr., developed a graphing technique that allowed them to more efficiently um, promote the, uh, the poinsettia and declared the plant as the Christmas flower in the United States. And he moved the family business to Encinitas where land was very cheap and abundant and started cultivating the poinsettia stock outdoors. In 1960s, his son, Paul Jr., uh, moved the business from indoor to become, becoming potted plants in greenhouses. And so if you ever have been to, to Encinitas, it is now known as the flower capital of the world. And um, up until about 10 years ago, the, the freeways were lined with greenhouses with a variety of flowers being grown. He, um, Paul Jr. actually began promoting his poinsettias um, on TV talk shows, such as the Dinosaur Tonight Show, Bob Hope's Bob Hope Christmas Special. And he would send these beautiful plants um, to these different shows so they would be on stage so people could see them. Eventually he was invited as an invited guest on these shows and got to speak more about the beautiful plant that became America's dream flower during Christmas. At its peak, the Eckes produced more than 90% of the world's poinsettia stock. And here's a picture in the 1960s of uh, the flowers when they were still cultivating them outside in the rows and rows and rows of poinsettias that were being picked and shipped um, mostly at this time um, in the United States because they'd send the stock to other companies internationally for them to grow the, the plant. So let's move on to the poinsettia plant itself and how we care for it. You know, we all get them at Christmas and we all throw them away at the end of the holidays because most of them are dead. And that's because we probably have not taken good care of the plant. It is no easy task as you are about to see. First of all, when you bring your poinsettia home, place it near a south or west window with plenty of bright but indirect sunlight. We don't want it to get direct sunlight because it could burn the leaves. We have to avoid placing it near cold or hot drafts or space heaters. Um, it doesn't like breeze. Um, avoid placing it next to the window in the winter because it will cause major damage if the, if the cold window goes below 50 degrees and the temps can kill the leaves that the if the plant is sitting right next to a window. They grow well in moist soil with temperatures between 60 and 70 degrees. And when the water, when water, um, the soil feels dry to the touch, it's, or it's lightweight, it's really, it's going to wilt very quickly and it's time to give it a great dosing of water, but there's a special way to do that. They also recommend to remove the decorative foil when watering because you never want to let the plant sit in excess water because it can cause a significant root rot. So that's when you bring it home this in November, December. Now, you do, if you want to keep this plant alive after the holidays, you don't want to fertilize it during the holidays. You want to start when you start when you see new growth, which will probably be in the spring. You're going to fertilize it with all purpose plant food at half the re recommended strength about every three to four weeks. You're also going to wait until late spring if you're going to transplant it outside, because as I said earlier, it does not like cold. And we want to make sure we don't have any chance of frost in our area before we plant it outside. I'd also recommend transferring it into a container two to four inches larger than its original pot rather than planting it in the ground because this plant is going to have to come in around October. Um, it won't survive the winter in, in our uh, county. You should also use Soil mixed with good drainage, mix it in peat moss and compost to help maintain moisture, but allow it to, to um, drain. Um, and you never want the soil to become soggy because again, that will affect the root system. 
So we get the plant home, we've done our basic things and it's still having problems. Um, this is how my poinsettia typically looks at the end of the um, holiday season. So why does it look like this? Well, it could be overwatering, underwatering, lack of fertilization, a proper fertilization. It could be temperature issues, lighting issues, and, and disease. And if it's indoors, it's most likely not going to be disease that typically um, is more relevant when it's outdoors. So the signs you're going to watch for that you have an issue, the first one would be wilting or curling leaves. Um, it's the first sign of plant stress. It can start from the top of the plant and work its way down. It can stop at start at the bottom and work its way up, or it can just be random. And sometimes it can wilt one day and perk up the next day. So it's a very schizophrenic plant when you're trying to diagnose what's wrong. If the poinsettia has leaf fall, it indicates that it's had more prolonged stress. And when the leaves fall, the older leaves are, um, which are less productive, are the first to fall because they're trying to provide the water and the nutrients for the new growth. At some point, you might see blackened leaves or spots on the leaves that are black. This would be a sign of rotting, and it, and it shows that the plant is severely damaged. So it's gone through a variety of stages that we haven't paid attention to it, and now it's somewhat shutting down. Overexposure to light or fertilizer can cause the black burns, and it starts with the crisp edges around the leaves. And disease can also cause the leaves to be speckled, streaked, or blistered. Um, we've all seen our leaves turning yellow. This is chlorosis. It starts with the bracts, which are the red leaves on the poinsettia that you see up in the top corner. They start fading, and then the green leaves start turning drab yellow or brown. And this is usually caused by improper watering or nutrition issues. And I want to just note that, and I'm going to mention this at the end, um, buying a plant from a box store because it's cheap probably means it's going to die fairly quickly because it's probably not had a good maintenance schedule before you bought it or as it's being shipped. So if you want a poinsettia that's going to last beyond the holidays, buy from a reputable nursery who knows how to take care of the plants and probably has bought from a more established grower. So we're gonna go through some of the things that we do, could do to um, cause these four different problems. And the most common is overwatering. Um, first of all, we probably keep it in that beautiful um, uh, colored, sleeve that it sits in, which means the water is collecting on the bottom. Um, the roots require very small pockets of air in the soil, as most plants do to function. Um, so you want to examine the soil if it's soggy or smells stagnant, if there's standing water in the drip tray or in that, in that beautiful uh, sleeve that it's sitting in. Um, it probably means that the roots itself are sitting in water and um, they don't have a way to breathe. So you want to take the plant out. You're going to try to inspect the roots. They should be many fine creamy colored roots, very light. If they're dark, they're going into a rotting stage. If the damage is minor, you want to drain out the excess water, even take the plant out of the plastic container it's in and let it dry out. But if it's that's, if that's so, it'll it could take up to two weeks to let it dry. Once you let the soil dry out, you wanna begin watering once the top two inches of the soil are dry, um, remembering to allow a drainage system to work. So underwatering is the other sign. Um, I think I've seen that more in my own plants that I have in because it gets very dry here. Unfortunately, it's, a, it's an evil twin, so the same sides of water overwatering, such as the drooping or shedding leaves, will happen with the underwatering. But the only clue you have is that the soil at the top of the, at the plant uh, level will be very dry and crumbly. So the solution is not to water from above, but to get a basin that 
the water is up halfway uh, um, up the uh, container that the plant is in and place the, that plant um, into the basin of water because it's the roots below that need the water most. You're gonna let that um, pot soak in the, in the pail or pan of water for 15 to 30 minutes. And then you're gonna let it drain for about another 15 minutes. And if you feel that it's still um, halfway up the soil is still too dry, you wanna repeat that. But you don't wanna let the pot sit in the water for more than 15 to 30 minutes at a time. Then the recommendation is to place the pot on a tray of pebbles so that the water drains down in and, it, and the plant doesn't actually sit in any water after that. So poor quality soil and drainage are another issue. Not knowing um, where your poinsettia came from, it may not have the proper soil quality to allow proper drainage. Um, there should be at least three drainage holes evenly spaced in your pot. Um, if the soil does not drain well, it's gonna become mud and the air pockets will disappear. So examine the, so if you're, if you're having any of the problems of wilting leaves, what you wanna do is repot the plant in a higher quality potting mix with perlite and moss. Perlite protects the air spaces and the moss allows for drainage, but at the same time will retain some of the moisture. They also uh, recommend using the plastic nursery pots sanitized if you have them, if you're gonna keep it indoors. Light exposure is another big issue. Poinsettia is like bright, but indirect light for six, four to six hours a day, day. Too much direct sunlight can scorch the leaves. So put them near a window, but not where the direct sunlight will come in. And too little light will weaken the plant so it's unable to grow and defend against pests and illnesses. The solution is placed in a south or west facing room near a window, but again, not with direct light and or excess radiant heat, because just as in the winter being next to a cold window can call, cause damage, so can the radiant heat from the window during the summer. It does not like drafts. So all of us who have the heat on in the winter, um, it's a tropical plant. They just like cold as much as, such as air conditioning and cold window pane, but they also don't like the hot air. Um, they prefer temperatures between 60 and 75 degrees. If they do become too cold, they can quickly wilt and they may potentially die. Um, they also need consistency. So they don't want cold drafts in the morning and then hot drafts in the other in the afternoon. So uh, I, I, as I was doing this presentation, I thought I have no idea in my house where I put this, this plant that I don't have either air conditioning coming on and blowing on it or the heater. Um, lack of humidity, as I mentioned, they're a tropical plant. In, in tropics, they have a lot of humidity. Um, wilting leaves and crisp browning leaf edges point to lack of humidity. Your solution would be, um, it could be extreme where you're actually placing a humidifier next to the area so it has uh, the same consistency of humidity day round. Um, an easy solution is placing the, the uh, container um, with the plant in it on a pebble tray, probably two to three inches deep, but filled with water so the plant's not sitting in it. But that, that water in the tray will add to the humidity right near the plant. They like to maintain an atmospheric humidity at 30% or higher. Um, again, in our area, that I think that is sometimes very difficult to achieve. So the other uh, thing that you could see with your poinsettia is root rot. It's caused from overwatering and allowing the roots to sit in water for an extended period. And due to the lack of oxygen, the plant will eventually die because of the buildup of naturally occurring fungi, which devours the roots. The wilted yellow yellowing and falling leaves are one of your clues to check the root system. Um, if, if you find that you may be having root rot, remove the plant from its pot, rinse off all the old soil, 
uh, clip off any damaged black or brown roots. And if the entire root system is black and brown, the plant is going to die. And repot the plant in a sterilized plastic plant, pot with the soil mixture that we mentioned before, which is perlite and moss. Um, and this gives it hopefully a better drainage system, plus the ability to hold moisture that the roots actually need. Um, lack of nutrients. Now this applies mostly when you're trying to maintain your plant beyond the holiday season. Um, they suggest not to give the plant nutrients from the time you bring it home to into January. It has already been loaded up with nutrients and adding more may just be more detrimental to the plant. Um, but once the season is over, if you're going, going to try to keep the plant alive for the rest of the year, you will need to feed it regularly so that one, it maintains the color of their leaves and the bracts and that the plant grows. Um, leaves will turn yellow and the edges will crisp if the plant is malnourished. Um, and that unfortunately is some of the same symptoms of other things we just discussed. So it's always like which one of the culprits is killing your plant. As always, if you use too much fertilizer, your leaves will also yellow, turn yellow and die. So fertilizer is again, one of the important, is important once a new growth develops. This will typically start um, if it's indoors in the February, March timeframe. Um, and once a month, you're going to want to add a liquid fertilizer at only half the strength to avoid fertilizer burn. Um, they suggest using seaweed or fish emulsion as it contains more micronutrients that this plant desires. And if you get it to stay alive all the way through the year to November, after November, you want to stop fertilizing and then restart up in the spring. And we'll go into more detail of what to do around the um, fall time period if you want to get the plant to have the bracts turn color again. So a couple of the things on the nutrient deficiency, magnesium is one of them. It's very common in poinsettias. The symptoms are scorching on the edges of the, of the edges and the tips of the leaves and yellowing between the veins of the leaves, just not the whole leaf leaf. And in this instance, you can apply three tablespoons per square yard. Um, and they use this as basically a, uh, if it's planted in the ground, of Epsom salts in spring and summer. So you can certainly reduce that for a single pot. Melodium uh, deficiencies, which I'm going to say is MO because it's a, a long word to pronounce, is the most common deficiency um, in micronutrients and poinsettias. And typical symptoms are yellowing of the leaf margin, progressing to marginal leaf burn. And the component of the fertility regime is one third cup of ammonium molybdate dissolved in one gallon of water. And you can buy ammonium molybdate um, on Amazon. It's a small jar, very easy um, to use. And again, you can decrease this quantity based on how many poinsettias are, are the size of the garden you have. Um, another thing to consider is high uh, pH can induce nutrient problems in poinsettias. They recommend a pH range from 5.8 to 6.5. Iron deficiency is the most common problem if the pH is above 6.5, at which new leaves will exhibit the chlorosis, which is yellowing. Lower the pH with iron sulfate drench and or use a, an acidic fertilizer. Iron deficiency can also occur with root death, over, over irrigation and poor drainage. Um, so inspecting the roots um, is one of the problems to determine the, this particular problem. One other thing, um, if this, typically this won't be an issue indoors unless you're bringing pests in from other plants. Um, you know, if we're bringing plants in the house now from outside because of the weather, you may be bringing pests in that can attack your poinsettia indoors. It can, it's susceptible to aphids, mealybugs, soft scale white flies and spider mites, all of which we have in our yards. I found this really interesting. It also has a poinsettia horn, hornworm, not quite 
like the one that we have on our tomatoes. It doesn't have the, the biggest spike, but it can de defoliate an entire plant in one day. Um, the solution, if you see any pest on your plant, is to quarantine that plant from all your other plants. Decide what kind of uh, pest it is and treat with the appropriate insecticide. And of course, if you hand, have harm worms, just hand pick them off. Dispose of any um, leaves that may have um, pests on them um, so that they don't, and put them in the trash can so they don't infect other plants. Diseases, um, poinsettias are most susceptible to fungal diseases, but can um, have some bacterial or viral diseases. Fungal diseases includes Pythian root rot, rhizotonic, rhizotonia root or stem rot, black root rot, scab, powdery mildew, or botrytis blight, which is a gray mold. Bacteria will include soft rot or bacterial canker. And the viral disease most that they're most susceptible is mosaic virus. But in some cases, this has been introduced because it's desirable to keep the plant shorter and produce more flowers. But if you but plants that do have the mosaic virus are in a controlled situation in a greenhouse and are treated appropriately as they grow. Again, just like with pests, you wanna quarantine that plant, trim away all your infected leaves and treat against with a, a broad spectrum plant medicine that uh, treats all fungicides and that is your best defense. Um, I'm not gonna go through this specifically, but this will be posted on our U of A website. Um, it does go through all the different symptoms. Again, a lot of it is the same with the yellow leaves, the leaves dropping, but in the cankers um, you, and scabs, you will see um, really like scabs on your um, the stems um, or lesions on the stems. And that's a clear definition that you have a fungal disease. So we've made it past the holidays. Um, what you're gonna do with your plant for the rest of the year, you're gonna keep it in, whether you have it indoors or outdoors, you're gonna keep it in an indirect bright sunlight and you're gonna fertilize it once the new growth appears, then midsummer and then early fall. And at, if it's outside, check routinely for pests. Continue to prune off any dead parts of the plant. And if it gets straggly, what you wanna do is pinch back the, the stems, the variety of uh, stems to about five inches tall and get it to be fuller and it'll grow into um, a, much, a much larger and fuller plant as it grows. Around Labor Day, if it's outside, move to indoors. Um, to an area that gets about six hours of sun and fertilize one quarter of the recommended strength. As they say the autumn equinox, which is just shortly after Labor Day, but sometime around the end of September, you wanna start the plant on its 16 hours of uninterrupted total darkness, and then followed by eight hours of bright light. Um, this is the process that turns the brack leaves, which are now green, into your red. Um, I wanna emphasize when we say it has to be total darkness, no night light, no little lights that, you know, don't open the door and check on it. When it's closed, it's closed. In the greenhouses, what they do is they have sliding dark shades that at the time that they start their, their uh, 16 hours, the entire greenhouse has walls that come down and a top that comes over that shields every single bit of light. And then they roll back the shades and roll up the, the walls to allow the bright light. And this is repeated until uh, Thanksgiving time. So it takes about six to eight weeks of uninterrupted darkness to lightness. At the same time, you want to maintain these plants at a temperature of about 60 to 65 degrees, and you want to continue watering them, um, not generously, but just enough to keep the soil moist. 
At Thanksgiving time, it's time to discontinue your dark schedule. You're gonna reduce your general watering and you're gonna place the plant where it can get six hours of direct sunlight. Again, not right at the window because you don't wanna scorch it. And that's a little, that makes the red color in the bracts even more brilliant. So now that you understand how difficult it is to grow a simple poinsettia plant and keep it alive, are you still interested in getting a point, poinsettias plant this holiday? Um, there's a variety to choose from, but make sure you buy from a reputable nursery. So here are, I'm going to share with you some of the um, Eki plants that they have uh, patented. And this is the traditional, the Jubilee Red that I think we've all come to love and know as our, as our uh, traditional poinsettia. However, we have seen a variety of colors come out of the propagations. Um, the polar bear was their patented white poinsettia, um, has made a big splash in the poinsettia market. And many times you'll see the red and the white combined into floral baskets. Um, they also have what we call a marble look. Um, it's marble jingled, but it's a variety of colors within the leaves and it's called the jester. Um, you can find them in a white pink, a white with a yellow uh, streak through it, um, speck, reds with speckling of white and some pink with also uh, streaks or speckles. Um, the vision of grandeur is a, actually a peach colored poinsettia um, with a double leaf full uh, bracts. Um, and we have the Peter Star. Um, they come in a variety of different pinks um, with the white and the traditional red. Um, and then they've gotten hybrids to be the Jingle Bell Rock. Um, and uh, they also have one, I don't have a picture here, which is peppermint, um, more stripes. And they have one that's speckled with uh, it's infused with red and white uh, designs within the leaves. I don't have pictures of it, but we also have a yellow poinsettias now and a very light mint green leaf on top of the bracts with the green, dark green underneath. Now, if you see the poinsettias that are blue or purple um, with glitter on it, those are all sprayed and they really aren't the true colors. Um, this one is called the winter rosebud. It's a variegation, so it does look like roses. Um, you won't see this most often in this region. Um, you'll see it more in the international community in Mexico. And lastly, um, the Eki still own the flower fields in Carlsbad. And this is a picture of what they prepare on an annual basis, which is the a flag in its red and white poinsettias. Uh, the blue is not the poinsettias, it's another uh, flower, but this is their traditional tribute um, during the holiday season. And that's what we have for today. Do we have any questions? Well, that was excellent. Um, we do have a question. Do all the different colors require the darkness in order to be colored? Yep. If you don't have, a, if you don't provide the 14 hours of darkness, 14 to six, or 12 to 16 hours of darkness a day, you will just have a green plant with beautiful, a plant with beautiful green leaves. And possibly the, the flower, uh, the yellow saithia also needs the darkness for it to form. Excellent. Well, I was having arguments today as I was encouraging people to watch because they're all like, oh, it's a poisonous plant. And I'm like, no, come no, on, it's, it's not. really <laughs> not. Um, yes, it can give your dog or cat a little bit of indigestion or diarrhea, but they're not going to die from it. Nope. And and again, for um, it can, the, the white milky substance, depending on your sens skin sensitivity, even if you're not allergic to latex, mm -hmm. it has been known to just do a some irritation, just like you might get in your garden from other plants. Um, but one of the things, if you are working with your plant, make sure you wash your hands afterwards as you would with anything else. 
true that. Well, Lauren, thank you so much. Um, this has been a wonderful presentation and a great way to wrap up the Master Gardener uh, Zoom presentations for 2022. We'll be back with you all in January. We haven't set our schedules up yet, but it'll be toward the end of January. Watch wherever you found out about this one. And we'll be bringing you some great presentations next year.